Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida at AaronV.com. Previously on Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. We're talking about the Citizens Commission to investigate the FBI and their daring 1971 burglary to expose FBI secrets. In the 1950s, Hoover began an illegal counterintelligence and surveillance program. The program involved infiltrating agents into suspect groups, burglaries, illegal wiretaps, intimidation, planting false documents, and spreading false rumors to sow discord among the targets. Even American presidents were afraid of Hoover. The war became in increasingly unpopular, the government was infiltrating the protest organizations with informants. And they weren't just serving as spies. They were serving as agent provocateurs to stir up trouble. We need to go to the town of Media, Pennsylvania. It was the site of a minor office of the FBI that was run by just five men. The place was ransacked. The doors of cabinets were open and files were gone. Nobody had burgled the FBI like this before, and all their files were missing. Initially, the press was reluctant to publish the commission's documents, but they ended up being released. Hoover was enraged. Hoover authorized an investigation of the events up to 200 agents looking for the members of the Citizens Commission. Did they ever catch the burglars? Before talking about the results of the FBI investigation, we should discuss what we now know about the Citizens Commission. So let's talk about a physics professor. His name is William C. Davidon, and he spent almost all his free time in anti-war work. He fell in with a group of Catholics. He regarded them as the most radical and courageous people he had met in the peace movement. Priests and nuns, ex-priests and ex-nuns, the young sons and daughters of working-class Catholics. Not all was well in the peace movement. Trust was fraying. Peace organizations had been infiltrated by informers. And so, David and approached nine of his friends and asked them a simple question. What do you think of burglarizing an FBI office? The only one of them turned him down. The other eight agreed. They included three women and five men. Though all of them owed their awareness of burglary as an act of resistance to the Catholic peace movement, only one of them was a Catholic. Four of them were parents of young children. But now, with American society coming apart at the seams and the FBI apparently violating the rights of American citizens, they would embark on a desperate mission. But not all of the nine companions would make the full journey. One of them would turn back. He would even threaten to betray the others and turn them in. This mystery has been solved, so in our next episode from The Reason Perspective, we'll simply tell you what happened. This will include the inside story of what the Citizens Commission did, and it will include the things the FBI did to catch them. Then, in The Faith Perspective, we'll look at the moral questions involved in the FBI break-in. Specifically, was the break-in itself morally justified? Were the tactics the commissioners used morally justified? And were were these the right people to do it? We'll also tell you some of the shocking secrets about what the FBI had been up to. You're listening to episode 108 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about the Citizens Commission to investigate the FBI and their daring 1971 burglary to expose FBI secrets. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. In 1971, a group of nine concerned citizens decided that they needed to take matters into their own hands and begin an investigation of the FBI. They named themselves the Citizens Commission to investigate the FBI. To get to the truth, they broke into an FBI office in the dead of night and took all the files. When the files were released, it shook the FBI, and the agency has never been the same. We now know who the burglars were, but how did they go about their daring plan? How did the FBI try to catch them, and what secrets was the FBI trying to keep from the public's knowledge? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. So, Jimmy, before we begin, what do we need to say? 
Today, we're going to be telling the story of how, in 1971, a group of people exposed a widespread pattern of illegal activity by the FBI, which led to people actually dying. So whatever else you may think about the Citizens Commission and their times, bear that in mind. They really did expose actual crimes and lots of them, including fatal ones, that the FBI was committing with authorization right from the top. So let's jump right into it. How did the Citizens Commission go about their plan? They realized right away that if they were going to succeed, they'd need to maintain strict secrecy. So they began a series of clandestine meetings in one of their houses. As Betty Metzger explains in her book, The Burglary. The strict secrecy rules were not easy to maintain, especially about something they knew their friends in the anti-war movement would find riveting. Secrecy was against their nature. They enjoyed talking with friends about politics and about what they were doing as activists. Suddenly, such conversations had to stop. They realized that given what they planned to raid, an FBI office, they were likely to fail if any information about their plan leaked. If they were going to be arrested, they wanted it to be for something they actually did, not something they planned to do. There was no room for casual talk now. Although they were based in Philadelphia, the Citizens Commissioners quickly realized that they would have no chance of breaking into the main FBI office there. It was in a federal building and was too tightly guarded, and there were people moving around in the building 24 hours a day. So they went to the suburb of Media, Pennsylvania, where the FBI maintained a tiny satellite office that was located on the second floor of an apartment house. It was empty in the dead of night, and so that was the FBI office that they picked. Now that the commission knew what office they'd be breaking into, they needed to pick a night for their break-in, and so how did they do that? The ideal night would be one when the people in the apartment building wouldn't be paying attention to noises in the office because they'd be distracted by something else. And fortunately, there was a really big distraction coming up. I want to make one prediction. I'm not calling around. I predict that when I meet Joe Frazier, this will be like a good amateur fighting a real professional. This will be like a kid out of the Olympics meeting the fastest heavyweight champion that ever lived. This will be no contest. All right, what do you say, Joe? What do you say to that? I'd say he's just got a bunch of noise. That's all. He's going way back in the time of, uh, let's say, 20 years ago. You know what I mean? This is the day, man. You understand? I just want you not fighting Glory. You're not fighting Oscar Bonaventure. You're not fighting Sonny Liston. You fighting Joe Frazier. Well, everybody knows that's, that's not the point. That's the point. Joe, what's what? your prediction? My prediction: the fight wouldn't go to distance. Oh, won't I'll go stop the distance. it. Yes, Muhammad Ali would be boxing with Joe Frazier in what was billed as and is still known as the fight of the century. The two pugilists would square off in Madison Square Gardens in New York City on the night of Monday, March 8th, 1971, and people all over the nation and the world would be tuning in to find out who the heavyweight champion would be. So, that's the night the commission chose. The citizens commissioners would need to be able to physically enter the FBI office without making so much noise that it would alert the people living in the apartments in the building. So, how do they plan to do that? One of the commissioners, Keith Forsyth, started acquiring a new set of skills. You couldn't really go down to a technical school and say, I want to learn how to burglarize buildings. (laughs) But there was one course of instruction that included that skill set and that was perfectly legitimate. Forsyth explains. I took a correspondence course on locksmithing, bought some spring steel and a grinding wheel, made some tools and started practicing. It's not hard to do. It's just a manual skill like anything else. A hell of a lot easier than playing the guitar. The fact Forsyth made his own tools rather than buying them also was important. It meant that there would be no sales records that could identify him as someone who had recently purchased the kind of tools you need to pick a lock. The Citizens Commission would also need to know about the office that they would be breaking into as they formulated their plan. So how did they get the information about the office that they needed? They started casing the joint, and they did so in a really systematic and thorough way. Betty Metzger explains. Because the burglary was scheduled for a Monday evening, they cased the neighborhood on weekday evenings between 7 and 11 p.m. from mid-January through the week before the burglary. The most difficult aspect of casing was sitting in cars for several hours on evenings during the coldest months of the year. 
The burglars watched the blocks near the building from inside parked cars and Williamson's van for three to four hours evening after evening. They prepared a to-do list of what they needed to monitor, the movement of vehicles on the two streets, Front Street and Veteran Square, that intersected at the corner where County Court Apartments, the building that housed the FBI office, was located. How parking patterns changed on those two streets and other nearby streets in the course of an the evening. The movements of residents in and out of the building on the two floors above the FBI's second-story office. The movements of the building manager who lived directly below the FBI office. The movements of the people who worked in the offices in the basement and on the first and second floors of the building, including in the draft board office on the second floor. The movements of people who lived in nearby houses and apartment buildings. The schedules and routes of local police who patrol the neighborhood. The lighting patterns in the FBI office and other nearby offices, apartment buildings and houses, the schedules and routes of trains, buses and taxi cabs that serve the area and how they affected the arrival and departure of people in the, the area, closing times of nearby bars and restaurants, the movements of people who worked at night across the street from the FBI office at the county courthouse, especially the schedule and movements of the courthouse guards. This information was vitally important. Knowledge about traffic patterns, for instance, determined where Forsyth would park when he arrived first to pick the lock. It also helped determine where and when the inside crew, the people who would enter the office and remove the files, should be dropped off and the routes the getaway car drivers should take after they picked up the inside crew. So as you can see, they were really thorough. And as they were casing the neighborhood, they took the precaution of sitting in their cars in male-female pairs. That way, if anyone questioned them about what they were doing, they could pretend to be a romantic couple, which was just fine with some of the young men in the group. As part of the casing process, the commissioners learned that the FBI office was a series of rooms along a hallway in the building and that it had two doors, a main entrance and then a second door at the far end of the corridor. Keith Forsyth walked down the hallway in the building past the FBI office so that he could get a look at the kind of lock that the main door had on it so he'd know what he was up against. He remembered what the lock on the FBI office main entrance looked like when he walked by it after David Don first told him about his interest in burglarizing it. He recalls being amazed when he saw the lock on the door. That's really bizarre, he thought. He knew there were several types of high-security locks available. The one on the FBI office door was not one of those. It was a simple five-tumbler lock, easy to pick. And while the other commissioners were casing the neighborhood, Forsyth would spend hours picking a lock that was a duplicate of the one on the FBI's door, so he'd have lots of practice with that model. Were the commissioners concerned that once Forsyth picked the lock in the dead of night, it would set off some kind of alarm? Yes, and this meant that they needed to get eyes inside the FBI office before the burglary so they could see if there were alarms that they might set off. There also were several other questions they needed answers to. Betty Metzger explains. Were the cabinets and desks locked? Was there carpeting? What was immediately inside the other door that opened into the office from the outside hall, but always was closed when they observed it? And the biggest question, was there an alarm system in the office? So one of them had to go inside there during business hours. And that was tricky because people don't just waltz into FBI offices and start looking around while the FBI agents are there. You need to be able to explain why you're in an FBI office. And that's kind of hard to do if the agents haven't themselves summoned you, for example, for an interview for a case they're working on. But they figured out an excuse that would work. Although J. Edgar Hoover had all the female FBI agents fired in 1924, the women's movement was making strides in 1971, and there was pressure to start hiring them again. It was suspected that the ban on women agents wouldn't last long, and in fact, new female agents would be admitted to the Bureau just the next year, in 1972. So, just two weeks before the break-in... With the anticipation of women being hired as special agents, the commissioners chose one of their female members to go to the office pretending to be interested in the subject of women joining the FBI. The burglars agreed that Bonnie Rains would be the best person for this important job. She was 29, but with her long dark hair and bright smile, she easily looked the part of the college co-ed the other burglars suggested she pose as. Not only did the other burglars think that Bonnie looked very young, but they thought she was the member of the group most capable of looking totally innocent. When she called the office to ask for an appointment, she told Tom Lewis, the agent in charge there, 
that she was a student at a nearby college who was doing research for a class assignment and wanted to schedule an interview with someone at the media FBI office about FBI hiring practices. She told him she had already talked with other employers in the media area, and she hoped an FBI agent would be able to give her about half an hour of his time. So she got the appointment and went in a few days later. She wore her long, dark hair under a woolen stocking cap and put on a pair of horn-rimmed glasses to disguise herself, as well as wearing gloves to keep from leaving fingerprints. Then she purposefully arrived 15 minutes early, saying her bus got there sooner than expected. That way, she would have 15 minutes to just sit there, waiting for the agent she had a meeting with to become available, and she could use that time to just observe and case the office. While she was waiting, she asked one of the agents if she could get an employment application form for the college paper that she was writing. This meant he needed to get up, go to a filing cabinet, and open it. As he did so, Bonnie saw that the filing cabinets did not have locks, so the commissioners would be able to just open them up and take the files. During her visit, she also was able to see down the row of offices and determine what was in front of the far door at the end of the hallway, and it turned out that it had a filing cabinet in front of it. Most importantly, she was able to determine that there was no alarm system in the office, so the commissioners wouldn't have to worry about setting one off. After that discovery, I imagine the commissioners felt optimistic that they could really pull this off. Yeah, but now, just a few days before the break-in, something happened that shot fear through their hearts. Bonnie Rains and her husband John explain. Nobody in the group talked to anyone outside of the group about, about this. So there was no, it seemed to me there was no, no possibility of a leak until the ninth person in the group dropped out. Well, the ninth person knew who we were. Uh, knew our names, uh, knew how we put together the action. He had information that if he used, testified in court, it would put us in prison. So the fellowship of nine companions had been reduced to eight, and now they had a serious question to face. Should they go ahead with the break-in now that there was someone who had defected and could possibly give them away? Ultimately, they decided to go ahead. As the Fraser Ali fight of the century got underway, the commissioners sprang into action. And then Keith Forsyth, the group lockpick, received a second terrifying shock. I drove to the office. I had some lockpicks and a small pry bar inside my coat. I went in the building, I went up the stairs, and just about fainted. The door had a circular lock on it the kind that nowadays you see on a kryptonite bike locks. I mean, that type of lock is extremely difficult to pick. I was like, was this here and I didn't see it? In which case, I'm completely incompetent. Or was this not here and now miraculously, right before we're going to break in, it shows up, which means we've got a leak? And now that Commissioner Number 9 had left the group, there was a real possibility that he'd reported them or that word had somehow gotten back to the FBI, and they'd changed their lock to prevent the break-in. There might even be a squad of FBI agents inside the office waiting to catch them. Keith, therefore, called the others and let them know. Immediately, many in the group thought that the operation should be called off. However, Bonnie Rains remembered seeing that filing cabinet in front of the other door at the end of the hallway, 
And when Forsyth inspected it, he discovered that it still had an ordinary, easily pickable lock on it. Forsyth then picked the lock on the second door, but he found it was sealed by a deadbolt. He could hear the building supervisor listening to the Fraser Ali fight on the floor below him, so he waited until there was a swell of the crowd cheering and used a crowbar to force open the door despite the deadbolt. He then took five minutes to slowly inch the door further open, carefully walking the filing cabinet across the floor a bit at a time so as not to make too much noise until he had the door open enough that he could fit through it. He then grabbed his tools, went into the office, and opened the front and main door from the inside. The commissioner's inside team then entered the office, opened the filing cabinets and desks, and emptied them into the suitcases. Back outside, the guard at the courthouse across the street was out in front of the building watching the street, but he seemed to take no notice as the commissioners came out of the building, put their cases into their getaway cars, and drove off. The commissioners had the FBI's files. And the commissioners weren't the only winners that night. Frazier has the man in the corner. Ten seconds. Five seconds. We'll have an interview with the winner and maybe with the loser. There it is. The round is over. We're waiting for the decision. And the, the ring is starting to cloud up despite the security measures taken. And the people are coming in the ring, and this was not supposed to happen. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the winner Charlie by Bowles unanimous decision and his heavyweight title. champion of the world, Joe Frazier. Joe Frazier. For the first time in his career, Muhammad Ali was beaten. And like Muhammad Ali, it was the first time the FBI had been beaten this badly. So what happened once the FBI agents came in the next morning and found all the files in their office missing? As we mentioned in our previous episode, J. Edgar Hoover was apoplectic, and he immediately launched a huge investigation that came to involve up to 200 agents looking for the members of the Citizens Commission. They immediately suspected that the burglary had been carried out by members of the anti-war movement, and so they started focusing on the many, many anti-war activists in the Philadelphia area. And they started developing some leads. So what kind of leads did they have? Like we said, not a lot of people visit an FBI office on their own initiative. And one of the few who had recently visited the Media Pennsylvania office was Bonnie Raines. Uh, She'd come in on her own initiative just two weeks before to case the joint, and that made her an immediate suspect. The FBI had a sketch artist make a drawing of her, which they circulated privately, hoping to find an activist that looked like her. The sketch was quite good, but fortunately for Bonnie, there were a number of other anti-war activists who looked like her. In particular, there was another woman in Philadelphia who did, and the FBI initially settled on her as a suspect, not Bonnie. Also, the FBI started spying on Commissioner Number 9, the man who had left the group. Betty Metzger writes, Immediately after publication of the first stories about the contents of the files, the investigation of the burglary became much more intense. Investigators placed the man who dropped out of the group and the woman who looked like Bonnie Raines under what the FBI called fissure or physical surveillance. The most visible fissure techniques used in the investigation were ones that involved agents sitting in parked cars along the tree-lined streets of the Powelton Village neighborhood in West Philadelphia, not far from the University of Pennsylvania. They sat there in several cars for many hours every day for weeks in front of these old brick row houses converted to apartments, physically surveilling people and street life in general. It was a strange technique. It was difficult to imagine how they thought such practices would lead to discoveries about media suspects. The beards that some of them were growing failed to help them blend into the community. They continued to look like what they were, FBI agents sitting in cars. And the residents of Powelton Village quickly sussed out this fact, and they responded by poking fun at the FBI visitors at one of their local street fairs. This neighborhood has a history of having street fairs, and we're just using a different kind of content this time. We're going to be auctioning off media files. We're going to be selling full life-size portraits of the FBI agents who've been infiltrating our neighborhood, and just in general having a good time. from 
the American society just for living here. Uh, you can't walk down the street without somebody watching you and trying to figure out who you're related to, where you're going, what you're all about, and putting you into a little pigeonhole. But while the locals were having fun at the expense of the FBI visitors, the commissioners themselves were still terrified that they were going to get caught and go to prison. But why? Except for Bonnie, the FBI didn't know what any of them looked like, and they'd been very careful to wear gloves so they wouldn't leave fingerprints. Yes, but humans aren't the only thing that leaves what we sometimes call fingerprints. Uh, Typewriters as folks will know, also leave their own kind of fingerprint, special quirks that each individual typewriter has that can let law enforcement identify which typewriter a document was written on. Well, what very few people knew back in 1971 was that the photocopiers of the day did the same thing. Two of the commissioners had used photocopy machines at their universities to make copies of the media files that they mailed out. Betty Metzger explains. A local Xerox official had told the investigators these crucial facts. Every Xerox copier's drum leaves unique markings on each copy produced on it. Some of those markings make it possible to determine which model of copier produced the copy, and other markings make it possible to trace a copy to the specific machine on which it was made. Most copiers at that time produced copies that contained visible odd marks, but few people understood that those marks were evidence of which copier produced a given page. A Xerox official examined a copy of the statement Commissioner John Raines read to reporter Bill Wingle the morning after the burglary, a copy of which the FBI got from Wingle after he subsequently received a hard copy of it in the mail. The official said the marking indicated the document had been copied on a Xerox model number 660 desk type copier. The next step was obvious. The Bureau needed to collect sample copies that had been made on model 660 copiers, as many as possible. And so they started going to every Xerox 660 copier in the Philadelphia area collecting samples. And the commissioners knew that the FBI was doing this because they read about it in the newspapers. And they knew that the FBI had a promising lead that could expose them. And then the most terrifying thing of all happened. Commissioner John Raines explains. It was only a few weeks after the break-in, and the doorbell rings. And it's the number nine guy, the guy who dropped out, and he's there. And he wants to come in. And we invite him in. And he says, I'm thinking about turning you in. That's right. Commissioner number nine showed up on Bonnie and John's doorstep and said he was thinking about turning in the whole group. But why would he do that? He hadn't turned them in before the break in. John Raines explains. And he said, the reason is I've been told that there are some secret files that are very sensitive, bearing upon national security and that uh, you haven't sent those to the newspapers yet, but uh, you can do it anytime you decide to. I, I assured him. That was not the case. I'm telling you the truth. There's nothing in those documents, national security stuff. And he seemed to accept that, but he left. And our lives, our futures left with him. Betty Metzger continues the story. Bonnie and John Raines struggled with how to deal with this situation. When the man left that night, they were not confident they had convinced him not to turn them in. Sometime later that evening or the next day, they got an idea. Their kitchen did not really need a new coat of paint, but they thought painting it all day with him might give John Raines an opportunity to have a long and rambling conversation that would convince him not to turn the burglars in. Given the possible consequences of his threat, they felt something had to be done. This was all they could think of. They called him and asked him if they could hire him to help John paint the kitchen. He agreed and arrived for the job early Saturday morning. Standing on ladders across from each other, the man and John Raines talked nearly all day. As they covered the kitchen walls with a coat of warm yellow paint, he revealed more about the source of his concern. He said he had no problem with the documents that had been released so far, the revelations about how the Bureau operated, the spying on Americans. He thought those documents might even have a positive impact. But he was very worried about what his girlfriend had told him. It wasn't clear from what he said whether she knew he had once been part of the group, but John was left with the impression that she suspected he was close to the group, if not part of it. He told John she had convinced him that documents stolen at the media office that had not yet been made public 
would reveal national defense secrets, including the location of missile defense systems. National security, she had told him, was now about to be seriously endangered because of the stolen documents. John insisted this was not true. He told him he thought his girlfriend was working for the FBI and that she had got that idea from them. John emphasized that he had seen all of the stolen documents and that none of them revealed defense secrets or posed a danger in any way to national security. I think he was on the verge of giving us up, said John Raines years later. His girlfriend was really pushing him. He was very frightened. By the end of that Saturday, the kitchen looked fresh and new, and John hoped he had convinced him not to turn them in. The Raineses convinced themselves that they had quieted him down, cooled him down. That's what they hoped. But they were not sure and remained afraid he would turn them in. And they never heard from him again. So how did the FBI's investigation proceed after that? The commissioners had a number of very close calls uh, with the FBI, but they were helped by the fact that the Bureau actually suspected other people in the anti-war movement. So their investigation was somewhat misdirected. Eventually, on March 11th, 1976, five years after the break-in, the FBI closed its investigation. The statute of limitations for the break-in was only five years, and now the statute of limitations had run out. The commissioners had not been caught. They got away with it. So then how is it that we know who they are today? Did they immediately announce themselves once the statute of limitations ran out? No, the matter remained a mystery for 43 years. The commissioners kept their identities a secret for almost half a century after the break-in. But in 2014, they revealed themselves publicly, and they did so in two ways. First, a book, which we've been quoting from, came out. The book is called The Burglary, The Discovery of J. Edgar Hoover's Secret FBI. It's written by Betty Metzger, who was the Washington Post reporter they mailed some of the initial media files to and who was the first one to publish them. In the intervening years, she continued to investigate the Citizens Commission and learned their identities. She gained their trust, and they told their story to her for her book. They also told their stories to a documentary filmmaker named Joanna Hamilton, and in 2014, she released a documentary about them called 1971, the year of the original break-in. Both the book and the documentary were very helpful sources for this episode, and I highly recommend them both. Definitely check them out, get copies. Before we leave the reason perspective, let me ask one more question. Do we know the identity of the man who we've been calling Commissioner Number 9, the one who quit the group? His identity is not publicly known. Obviously, the other eight commissioners know it, as does Betty Metzger. However, since he hasn't chosen to come forward, the others have respected his privacy and just referred to him as the ninth member or the ninth guy. Okay. Jimmy, this seems like an opportune time to thank our patrons for their support. Uh, we want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Steve H., Terry R., Teresa N., Samuel C., and Ian S. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida at AaronV.com. So that's the reason perspective. What can we say about the FBI break-in from the faith perspective? Was what the Citizens Commission did fundamentally morally justified or not? The fundamental thing that they did was take FBI files. According to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and this is in paragraph number 2408 if you want to look it up, the Seventh Commandment forbids theft, that is, usurping another's property against the reasonable will of the owner. There is no theft if consent can be presumed or if refusal is contrary to reason and the universal destination of goods. This is the case in obvious and urgent necessity when the only way to provide for immediate essential needs, food, shelter, and clothing, is to put at one's disposal and use the property of others. The key words in there are against the reasonable will of the owner 
And there is no theft if refusal is contrary to reason. It is not reasonable to conceal evidence of crime. And so it is not the sin of theft for the Citizens Commission to take evidence of crimes committed by the FBI. It's not the sin of theft when law enforcement takes evidence of crimes from criminals, you know, and so it's not the sin of theft to take evidence of crimes committed by a government agency. Can you give examples of some of the things that people discovered about the FBI after the break-in? Yeah, some of these were in the files that the Citizens Commission took, and other things were revealed in the course of the investigations that that triggered. It turned out that 40% of the files taken from the FBI's media office were devoted to conducting political surveillance. 40% of the files are about political surveillance on American citizens. Two of those groups that were being surveilled were conservative. Ten dealt with immigration, and over 200 were liberal groups. So 100 times more liberal groups than conservative groups are being surveilled. This was very specifically surveillance of one side of the political spectrum. And they weren't just surveilling these groups. They were actively intervening in immoral and or criminal ways. For example, Betty Metzger explained something that the commissioners discovered on the night they got the documents. Within the first hour, one of them broke the silence with a sudden shout, Look at this! They all gathered round and together read the document that prompted the shout. It was advice to FBI agents, the the outcome of a meeting at FBI headquarters a few months earlier, of agents who specialized in investigating activists. Agents were advised in a newsletter prepared for such agents to, quote, enhance the paranoia and get the point across there is an FBI agent behind every mailbox, end quote. It took their breath away. After the burglar's initial reaction, they read the document again to make sure they had read it right the first time. Enhance the paranoia, an FBI agent behind every mailbox. They were as stunned as millions of Americans would be two weeks later. So that's not just surveillance of groups. To enhance the paranoia and get the point across there is an FBI agent behind every mailbox crosses the line into political intimidation. And they didn't stop there. They also lied in order to break up people's marriages. Commissioner Robert Williamson explains. An FBI agent had infiltrated this anti-war group on a campus, a college campus. There was a married couple, and this agent started a rumor that the wife was cheating on the husband, and he broke the marriage up. And that was in the file. He was proud of it. Needless to say, lying to break up a marriage is immoral. They also planted provocateurs in different organizations to encourage them to commit illegal acts so that the FBI could arrest them. That's what's known as entrapment. Not only had the FBI been monitoring Martin Luther King, they also encouraged him to commit suicide, as was revealed a few years later in testimony before the Senate's church committee. Uh, The Bureau went so far as to mail anonymous letters to Dr. King and his wife, which were mailed shortly before he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, and finishes with this suggestion. King, there is only one thing left for you to do. You know what it is. You have just 34 days in which to do it. This exact number has been selected for a specific reason. It has definite practical significance. It was 34 days before the award. You are done. That was taken by Dr. King to mean a suggestion for suicide, was it not? That's our understanding, Senator. J. Edgar Hoover was especially suspicious of African Americans, and sometimes the FBI would plant false rumors among African American groups in an attempt to get them to go to war with each other and kill each other. People actually died because of the FBI's deliberate attempts to get them killed. And they didn't just plant rumors to stir up trouble between groups. They also planted false rumors to harm individual people over things like making a charitable donation. Betty Metzger describes a particularly tragic case. A Los Angeles agent received enthusiastic approval from director J. Edgar Hoover for a plan to punish actress Jean Seberg in 1970 for giving a contribution to the Black Panther Party. The plan was tragically successful. 
the agent proposed to Hoover that Seberg, then several months pregnant, be publicly humiliated by planting the false rumor that her baby's father was a Black Panther leader. The planting of such a rumor, the agent wrote in his proposal, quote, could cause her embarrassment and serve to cheapen her image with the general public, end quote. The director approved the proposed plan, noting in his response that, quote, Gene Seberg has been a financial supporter of the BPP, the Black Panther Party, and should be neutralized, end quote. He advised Los Angeles agents to increase the effectiveness of the operation by waiting a couple months so Seberg's pregnancy would be more obvious when the rumor was planted. Apparently eager to move ahead, agents in Los Angeles planted the rumor with Los Angeles Times gossip columnist Joyce Haber as soon as the director approved the plan. Haber wrote that an international movie star who supported the Black Revolution was expecting and the Papas said to be a rather prominent Black Panther. With other details, Haber made it clear the unnamed star was Seberg. Soon after reading the rumor, Seberg went into premature labor and three days later gave birth to a dead white baby girl. After Seberg committed suicide on the anniversary of the birth of the dead baby in 1979, her husband, Romain Gary, the French novelist diplomat, said Seberg had suffered severe depression ever since the published rumor and the birth of her dead child. He said she had tried to commit suicide each year on the anniversary of the birth. And there was a lot more. One of the things that the media files revealed was the existence of an FBI program known as COINTELPRO, which was short for Counterintelligence Program. This involved a widespread pattern of criminal activity and civil rights violations, and in 1975, it became the subject of a major Senate investigation known as the Church Committee. The activities of COINTELPRO were so extensive that we'll be devoting a future episode just to it. So, yes, the FBI was engaged in a pattern of criminal behavior that did not have a moral right to cover up the evidence of its crimes. It, therefore, was not the sin of theft for the Citizens Commission to take those files and expose what the FBI was doing. Having a good goal doesn't mean that everything you do in service of that goal is good. As they say, the ends don't justify the means. Are there grounds for criticizing anything the Citizens Commission did? I can think of two particular things. First, when Bonnie Rains went into the media office pretending to be a college student working on a paper, she lied. Whether this is immoral will depend on your theory of lying. If you hold that all deliberate telling of falsehood is wrong, then her act on this occasion would be wrong. However, if you hold that falsehoods can be used in some circumstances, such as in legitimate wars or to protect human rights, like in the famous lying to the Nazis to protect Jewish lives example, then what she did was potentially justified. After all, she was lying to help protect the rights of American citizens by exposing the fact that the FBI was systematically violating them. The second ground for criticism that I can think of is I don't think that all of the members of the Citizens Commission were the right people for the job. Just because something needs to be done doesn't mean you're the one who needs to do it. This is something I, I sometimes see people get caught up in, in something and say, oh, something needs to be done. Yeah, but are you in a position in your life to be the one? that does something about it. Several members of the commission, including its leader, Bill Davidon, and also Bonnie and John Raines, had small children. If they went to prison, those children would have been raised without their parents. Now, I know that the Raineses did talk to relatives of theirs and make sure that the relatives would be available to raise the kids in case their parents were caught and went to prison. But in my view, this was, and this is just my view, you could argue it another way, but in my view, this was an unacceptable risk. There were lots of activists who could have participated in the break-in without putting the upbringing of children at risk. And in my opinion, at least, I don't think the members of the commission who had children should have participated. I would not have. So, Jimmy, what's your bottom line on this FBI heist by the Citizens Commission? The Citizens Commission to investigate the FBI did the public a service by taking the files needed to expose the FBI's pattern of criminal and lethally criminal behavior. Uh, they did so at great personal risk to themselves 
and they deserve our thanks for that. They also had a real effect because after the FBI's behavior was exposed, congressional oversight increased, and for a time at least, that kind of behavior was reined in. They also closed all of their hundreds of little bitty offices, like in media, so they couldn't be burglarized like that again. However, I do think there are grounds for criticism of the commission, especially the fact that some of the commissioners had small children whose upbringings should not have been put at risk. So, Jimmy, what further resources do we have for the listeners who want to find out more about this topic? Well, as I mentioned, we'll have a link to Betty Metzger's book, The Burglary, where they tell their own story, give you the inside scoop on everything that happened. And there's a lot more than we could go into in in this episode, especially if you want information about all the stuff the FBI was doing that came out. Get Betty Metzger's book, The Burglary. Also, we'll have Tim Weiner's book, Enemies, A History of the FBI, Ronald Kessler's book, Secrets of the FBI. Gary Nosner's book, Stalling for Time, My Life as an FBI Hostage Negotiator, which, among other things, chronicles his time negotiating with the Branch Davidians. Also, a link to the documentary 1971, where you can watch reenactments of the burglary and hear the commissioners tell their story in their own words on camera. We'll have links once again to pages on the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, the Citizens Commission to investigate the FBI. The Ali Frazier Fight of the Century, COINTELPRO, and the Church Committee. Excellent. All right. So let's move on to our mysterious feedback, one of my favorite parts of every show, because uh, I like to hear what folks have to say about the topics we, t- we discuss. Uh, this time we get feedback on our recent episode on sleep. Eric sends an email and says, uh, like you, Jimmy, I've had problems going to sleep or getting back to sleep because of a racing mind. Researchers discover that people with this kind of insomnia have a frontal lobe brain temperature higher than others. Basically, most people's front lobe goes down in temperature when they go to sleep, but some people's doesn't. So they tried lowering the temperature of the frontal lobe about a degree, and they were able to arrest the racing thoughts and enable the people to get back to sleep. They developed a product called Ebb Sleep, which I purchased, and I love it. Basically, it's a band, something like a mask, but it goes on your forehead that's tethered to a cooling system that pumps cool liquid through the band. I used to wake up at 3 a.m. or some other time and had difficulty getting back to to sleep for a couple hours. This no longer happens since I started using Ebb Sleep over six months ago. I encourage people to check it out. And I've known Eric for quite a number of years, and so if he says that he's had success with this product, to my mind, that makes it worth considering. I uh, haven't tried it myself. I did look at their website. We'll have a link to that in the further resources. Ebb Sleep is, it's Ebb as in E-B-B, you know, like the tide ebbing. So it's ebbsleep.com. It is somewhat expensive, but, you know, if you have this problem, check it out and consider whether it might be for you. Uh, David, son of Jesse, writes by email, I'm a big fan and patron of the show and just finished listening to the episode on sleep. I'm a primary care physician and bottom line, I couldn't agree more with what you said in this episode. Based on my training and experience, many, if not most Americans, undervalue the importance of a good night's sleep. And I totally agree with all your recommendations on how we can improve our sleep habits. One other thing I will mention is that you said that chronic snorers may have sleep apnea. And while this is true, I've also seen plenty of people who don't snore or don't know that they snore who also have sleep apnea, and it is probably very underdiagnosed in our society. So even if you don't snore, but you feel like you're tired even after a good number of hours of sleep, you could still have sleep apnea. A quick screening tool is called Stop Bang. Scoring high on it doesn't diagnose you with sleep apnea, but usually it's enough for most doctors to consider order testing for it. As always, people should talk to their doctor if they have concerns about things like this. Most doctors are happy to help people sleep better because it can make such a big difference to their health and happiness. Keep up the good work. And if I could ask a small favor, could you give a shout out to my father, Jesse, who I got hooked on your show a few months ago. We both look forward to listening every week. Thanks again, David. Yes, I am David, son of Jesse. 
So shout out to Father Jesse, and <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. David, for your patronage and for writing and for your good advice. I I wish the sleep episode was so long already, I, I really couldn't go into parasomnias or, you know, things that interfere with sleep, like sleep apnea. But next to sleeplessness itself, it is one of the worst sleep disorders affecting people in society today. And when we when we do a uh, future episode specifically on sleep disorders, we definitely are going to be talking about sleep apnea and how many people have it without even realizing it and all of the various destructive effects it has. Mm. Uh, Sam Devick writes on YouTube, when my little sister heard you say, why do we sleep? She said, we sleep so we're not grumpy in the morning. Who doesn't know that? <laughs> a very insightful answer. It it reminds me of a uh, of of an incident in my own life when I was in grad school. I was a philosophy grad student and focusing in philosophy of religion. And one day we were discussing in class the question, "Can God make a rock so heavy he can't lift it?" And I said, "No, because any rock that heavy would collapse under its own weight and become a black hole, and thus wouldn't be a rock anymore." <laughs> and my and my professor said. Welcome to academia. You have just answered the question without addressing the issue. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, Ernie Morales on YouTube writes, not even six minutes in, and this might have already passed Skinwalker Ranch as my favorite episode. Wow, cool. Uh, Stan writes on YouTube, the irony of it all. It's midnight. I'm drinking rum and just took a Unisom to help fall asleep. I need to work on this. Excellent enlightening episode. Yeah, do not combine alcohol and sleeping aids. Just do not do not do that. Yes, very that, bad. That does not end well. Go listen to our episode on the Radioactive Boy Scout if you need encouragement to, to not do that. Yes. Uh, Brooke Kennel writes on YouTube, This is easily one of the best science episodes you've aired to date. The two phases of sleep thing is really interesting. I might have to read the book you recommended about that. It makes sense that our sleep patterns would have evolved very differently from how we tend to sleep today. I've always felt the eight-hour workday was a bit unnatural. Necessary for much of the modern world, perhaps, but stressful and not really healthy for us. I sleep with an eye mask on, and I found it really helpful. My husband listens to audiobooks every night. I only listen to podcasts when I need distraction from my own thoughts, but it does seem to help relax me. When you guys do the future episode on dreams, I'm curious if you're going to look into the various claims that many Muslims are being led to convert to Christianity through dreams. I haven't really researched it, but my sister has been interested in some of their stories and wondered what you guys might make of it all. I have heard the same claims, so it's definitely out there anecdotally whether the claims are actually correct or not is something that could be difficult to research, but I'll see what I can find out. Excellent. Thank you all for that wonderful feedback. We really do like the, uh, getting that feedback from you. Uh, Jimmy, what do we have for mysterious headlines this week? Well, since we're talking about FBI secrets, uh, we have a secrecy theme for this episode in our headlines. Uh, you know how we talked about the fact that Xerox machines left small marks and, and stuff that could identify what machine a, a copy was made on? Well, guess what printers do? <laughs> uh, modern printers, like the one in your home office or at work, also add secret tracking codes to things, at least certain things. So we'll have a link so you can find out what those are in case you're planning any daring break-in for the good of the public, Mr. or Mrs. Robin Hood. Also, speaking of secrecy, the Knights of Columbus announced a while back that they were going to end the secrecy of their initiation ceremony. And frankly, I think this is a good thing. The fact that they had a secret initiation oath was used for a long time by anti-Catholics as, as, as an opportunity to attack the Knights of Columbus and make it sound like they were a sinister conspiracy that was up to no good. So anti-Catholics would circulate a false version of the Knights of Columbus oath that had them promising to do all kinds of criminal, immoral things, you know, like kill all Protestants or something like that. And because the actual Knights oath was secret, there was no way to refute those claims <laughs> because they wouldn't tell you what it was. Right. Uh, I know back in the 19th century, joining a secret men's club with a secret oath was like the thing 
but in the modern world, I, I, I like the not having the secret oath part. I did a number of years ago talk to a friend of mine who's a member of the Knights of Columbus, and he offered to actually give me a copy of the oath if I, if I wanted, but I, I, I didn't accept it at that time. Uh, who knows if I had revealed the secret oath of the Knights of Columbus back then, there might have even been a more secret oath where they really did promise to do bad stuff. <laughs> I could have fallen victim to that, although I doubt it. Yeah, well, uh, when I took the oath thirty odd years ago in college, it was a uh, it was pretty benign. So, I'm, yeah, I'm glad it it did seem strange that it was a secret ceremony, and I'm glad it's no longer secret. All right, so let's uh, at this time turn to the listener and ask, what are your theories about the Citizens Commission and the FBI secrets that they exposed? We want to hear from you, and you can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page, or you can send an email to mysterious at sqpn.com or send a tweet to at mys underscore world with the hashtag of mysterious feedback. So, Jimmy, what's our next episode going to be about? We're going to be talking about an event that occurred in the early 20th century that involves the creator of Sherlock Holmes, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. It is the story of the Cottingley fairies and the photographs that two little girls got of them. Hmm. Interesting. All right. We would really appreciate it if you would share this podcast with your friends and Write a review in Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts from to help us grow this community of listeners. Uh, and as we reach more listeners, the show gets better. It really does because it the show really depends on your contributions through feedback and topic suggestions and the like. So please share the podcast and help it grow. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion and links to those mysterious headlines on our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. And remember to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. <laughs>